2024, or maybe we should be calling it 2016-2. 2T16, 2-2016-2 two Furious. Folks, time is a circle. It's a common thought, we've all heard that phrase. Though maybe we didn't think the circle could be as short as an eight year time period. So I'm gonna describe an event, and then you tell me if that sounds like it's from 2016 or 2024, okay? A movie starring Emma Stone causes controversy at the Oscars. Donald Trump is set to run a presidential campaign against a long-term Democrat who is deeply unpopular. <laughs> very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. A global organization is trying to tell Israel that the actions it's taking against Palestinians are, are bad, and the United States is just sitting idly by. We'll never know, folks. It could be either year, and that's the thing. The parallels are so eerily similar between 2016 and 2024 that even prominent Twitter user Hosh Jaisman has commented on it saying this, it really feels like the internet is falling back to 2016 era where edgelords are getting more popular and everything is turning into drama and it's upsetting. Even slightly Slightly more famous Twitter user and YouTuber Kunkin Dasner agrees. This is just a complete regression into 2016 loser boy YouTube. It's like it never died. Oh, shit. So it's not just me. And what I want to try to focus on is the culture war of 2016 and 2024. So you'd think that maybe we could have made some progress over these last eight years, becoming a more accepting society, given the moments that have happened since 2016, right? We've had the Time's Up movement, the Me Too movements that made waves against workplace and personal harassment and assaults. The Black Lives Matter movement following the murder of George Floyd and countless others saw a nationwide push for recognition of police brutality. Democratic socialism calling for increased wages, unionization, and healthcare reform has become more and more mainstream. However, just as we have progressed on one end, we have regressed on the other end, arguably just as far. And before I get into the Overton window and how it shifts our focus on culture war issues, I need to say something first. If you're coming in here and you're upset because I've got this pride flag behind me, I get so many comments about this pride flag. That is not a pride flag. That is just a 70s inspired wall decor. So I don't want you coming in here and being like, oh, I can't even listen to this guy. He's just some weirdo with the pride flag. That's not a pride flag. This is a pride flag. That's right. Subscribe if you love trans people, folks. Leave a like if you hate capitalism and get out of here if you're stinky doo-doo fart head. How about that? And if you do get triggered by a, by a pride flag, that's a you problem. I don't know what to tell you. I will now be talking about the Overton window because the Overton window is just a way to describe what is generally accepted trains of thought by the public. An example of the Overton window shifting would be something like gay marriage. Even just 16 years ago, 16 years ago, we can see clips of our current president, Joe Biden, talk about gay marriage. Senator, do you support for... gay marriage? No, Barack Obama nor I support redefining from a, a from a civil side what constitutes marriage. There should be no civil rights distinction, none whatsoever, between a committed gay couple and a committed heterosexual couple. So that is genocide Joe Robinette Biden himself just 16 years ago, 16 years ago, agreeing with Sarah Palin on a debate stage that gay people should not be allowed to be civilly married. They need to find a different term. And now that does boil down to just a semantic argument. He does say that he believes that gay people should be allowed to enjoy the benefits of what a civil union gives people. So even just 16 years ago, the conversation around gay marriage was whether or not gay people can use the word marriage. Okay. And now if you say that you would be looked at like you're crazy. And 16 years is all it took for Joe Biden to go from him bumbling on about gay people being afforded proper usage of a word to this. I'm gay. Mom. I'm transgender. Joe Biden is gay and trans, folks. It took him 16 years to say gay people shouldn't be allowed to use the word marriage to being a gay trans person himself. But Overton windows do not just shift to the left. They also shift to the right. And an example of that that you may be familiar with would be how Americans view immigration. Because since just the year 2020, you can see on this graph how much more Americans have seen a decrease in support for immigration. And now I know what you're thinking, Josh. So what is it then? Which way has the Overton shifted? You shouldn't have brought it up. You didn't have hard, cold answers. And you're right. I don't have answers. But YouTuber JREG does. So let's listen to this video. Has a constant surface.
surface area that can never be broken. According to my exact, precise, scientific measurements, the Overton window has exactly a surface area of three centimeters squared. Now remember, the Overton window moving like this would be impossible because then the surface area would be greater than three centimeters squared. I have come to the conclusion that this is the only way the Overton window could have possibly shifted. Being in the dead center of the political spectrum is no longer within the Overton window. As the Overton window has become more accommodating to leftist ideologies and right-wing ideologies, it has become less accommodating towards centrist ideologies. So obviously this video is done in a satirical manner and it's steeped in satire and being done jokingly. But I think JREG actually has a very good point here because late stage capitalism has required Americans to be pushed into these quote unquote extremes. The moderate guy who just wants to go and grill burgers and, and live in a, you know, have a four person family and just chill. It's not able to exist as well anymore because of the effects of late stage capitalism. We have reached records high in cost of living and an inadequate increase in wages further pushes that problem. And it's causing all of the issues in the United States to just snowball, leading us into something terrifying. And that's where 2016 can come back into play. You see, capitalism only really works if you kind of forget that you're being oppressed by capitalism. Culture is what distracts us from the place that we have in the capitalistic machine. Do we want to be moderate and chill? Because I don't. Well, I think the idea, right, is if you're fighting for a leftist ideology, the idea would be we would be in a, a society where you could just chill. And that used to be true for a lot of people. It's not that true anymore. Uh, I'm focusing mainly on American politics, but this does extend uh, globally in a lot of uh, different countries as well. And it's just the result of late stage capitalism pushing us to these extremes. Culture is what distracts us from the role that we play in the capitalist machine. That can be anything from sports, TV shows, shows, movies, and yes, even video games. 2016 was the peak of a cultural phenomenon known as Gamergate. If you're unaware or if you're a normal person who hasn't thought about Gamergate in the last eight years, let me try to fill you in. So this information was taken from a video called Gamergate, the Untold Story by the Serfs. So in around 2014, there was someone by the name of Zoe Quinn. She made video games and she made this game called Depression Quest, and a lot of people really, really liked it. Then an ex-boyfriend of hers came out and said that she cheated on me with video game reviewers. That way they would leave positive video game reviews on her game and therefore we should all hate her. Now, it has been since proven that he was lying. He made all of this up. That did not stop gamers, though, from taking this and start being very upset about ethics in video game journalism. That's right. They were supposedly upset that video game journalist sites were being bought out by video game developers and people just sleeping with them. And so in response to an outcry of gamers being upset about ethics in video game journalism, they leaked Zoe's nudes, they review bombed all of her games, and then they subsequently doxed her and her current boyfriend. A totally normal response. Another major character is Anita Sarkeesian. And around 2012, Anita Sarkeesian had a website that she made videos for and a series she created called The Six Tropes of Women in TVs, Movies, and Comics. And all this set to do was from a feminist lens, look at tropes that women are commonly portrayed in these mediums and just talk about it and say, hey, maybe we could do better. It was well received. And so she wanted to make six tropes of video gaming. She created a Kickstarter with a very modest goal. And then gamers found it and got angry again. Them getting angry actually boosted the Kickstarter campaign, which caused her to raise way more money than she ori originally asked for. But it also came with an endless harassment campaign against this anti anti-SJW, anti-woke ideology that gamers started. This is where the birthplace of Gamergate really came off. Anita Sarkeesian to this day still has people upset with her and cyber stalking her. As you can see from this tweet from an account with over 200,000 followers, however bad you may think things are in your life right now, just remember you're not Anita Sarkeesian staging a wedding themed 40th birthday party at which she didn't actually get married. This was from earlier this month in 2024. People are still upset with her and all she did was make some videos and call for feminism to, I don't know, as we are saying in the chat, have some more representation in video games. There is zero proof that even actually happened, but just the idea of her talking about it and games getting quote unquote worse are what caused people to still attack her to this day. And you can see in the comments as well, uh, just extreme 
hatred and someone by the name of Carl Benjamin saying that is absolutely tragic also goes by Sargon of Akkad. We'll get back to him later because nothing and I mean nothing screams I'm a normal person like getting upset at somebody else's birthday party that they threw countries away from you that has literally never directly affected you not even once. Now, obviously, I don't want you all to just take my word on what has happened. I want to show you guys what the landscape was like back in 2016. So enter Milo Yiannopoulos. He is a right-wing grifter who rose to prominence by being a gay British man who hates the woke in 2014. Then he moved on to being a gay British man who openly hung out with neo-Nazi and alt-right movement founder Richard Spencer, who you might remember from this video. I'm kind of a simple... <laughs> Uh, Milo then moved on to becoming an ex-gay, by his own terms, British man, who has since failed to regain prominence ever since getting deplatformed in 2019. Now, I don't have time to get into the full slate of Milo's past, including defending sexual relationships between 13-year-olds and adults, or joining Kanye West's team in 2022, or many, many other terrible things he's done, but you'll have to trust me, he is not a good person. So Milo helped spearhead the Gamergate movement into mainstream media. There is a sort of of insurgent um, move in video games uh, from a couple of wacky left-wing feminists, and these are sort of far-left, Israel-hating, socialist weirdos. The journalists have sucked all this up and have bought it all, and the, the same journalists who protected video games when the religious right in the 1980s and 90s said that um, video games turn uh, kids into killers mm -hmm. and, um, and are violent. Those same journalists nonetheless have rolled over and accepted the feminist um, critique of video games and said, oh, well, video games can't make you violent, but they can make you sexist. So that is Milo trying his darndest to reframe this entire Gamergate issue around ethics in video game journalism, which at best shows that he's just an idiot buying into false narratives, and at worst is a extremely obvious dog whistle, trying to drum up a young white male gaming demographic into the alt-right movement. And really, when you boil down the argument that Gamergators have, being that the wokes are getting a hold of our video games, the obvious retort and question of that is, what's bad about representation? Why is it worse when a white character now becomes a black character or a Hispanic character or God forbid a woman? It does not innately pull from the, the quality of a video game. This implication that media cannot exacerbate bigotry, there's no research to show that that can make other people sexist, except that's just not the case because that implies that bigotry is just something that we all have innately and it's not a taught thing. And when gamer gators say stuff like, oh, just because I can beat up a prostitute in Grand Theft Auto, that doesn't mean I'm going to be sexist from it. And while that statement is probably true for most people, if you have a game that is predicated on dangerous stereotypes of minorities, whether it be women or race or ethnicities, that bigotry can be taught much more so than me playing Grand Theft Auto is going to make me go do a mass violence. So a lot of this Gamergate drama actually revolved around the idea that video game studios were being incentivized by like these feminist companies and other feminists to make women in their games ugly. That's the word you'll see used a lot is ugly. What's actually taking place was some games were being made with more inclusivity and some characters were being reimagined. The idea, however, that video game women in Western media were becoming less attractive was just Trojan horsed behind other issues in video gaming journalism and it was a very effective method. So back to Milo himself. He had previously talked ill about video games as a whole before Gamergate started and how they are a bane to society, even blaming a mass shooting on video games radicalizing the 2014 mass shooter Elliot Roger. But once those Gamergate checks started coming in, he and many like him could not stop milking that cow. Horizon Zero Dawn is arguably one of the more famous examples. If you're not aware of the video game Horizon Zero Dawn, there's this <laughs> image that they like to show, which is that they're trying to imply that this character, Aloy, there's a post that they made upset that in Horizon Zero Dawn 2, they gave her peach fuzz. This is a common complaint from Gamergate era. Can you explain to me why the hell Aloy has a beard and then is circling this little bit of peach fuzz? Have you ever been near a person? That's just facial hair. Every single person has facial hair. God forbid somebody who in this game is growing up in a like post-apocalyptic world has peach fuzz. And also the implication being that this made the game worse somehow. How, how, how 
I've played both Horizon Zero Dawn and Horizon Forbidden West. You know how much time I spent looking at Aloy's jawline? Zero minutes, because I was playing the game, because it was a good game. So Milo was a former contributor for a website called Breitbart and was a much more mainstream media mouthpiece than many others involved in the online movement of Gamergate 2016. But YouTube channels left and right started to talk about this cultural event. This gave rise to the anti-SJW movement, one that saw a major grip on YouTube and its audience throughout the mid to late 2010s. This was headlined by famous YouTubers such as Filthy Frank, who now goes by uh, Joji as a recording artist, iDubs, and H3H3. This edgelord humor was completely normalized in the Overton window shifting online. This was the birth of a major, major online alt-right pipeline, funneling their target audience being primarily young white males toward a reactionary line of thinking. To help describe this, I want to go to a Innuendo Studios video in part of the series series of how to radicalize a normie. This is a series that I cannot recommend enough if you know somebody in your life who maybe needs a little bit of radicalization to the left or is slipping down the alt-right themselves. This video series is so, so good. So let's watch a little bit of this clip called How to Radicalize a Normie. What you need to know before we begin is around 2013, the Nazis went online. Hate groups in the U.S. as tracked by the Southern Poverty Law Center had been growing in number since the knots, but between 2012 and 2014, they dropped by almost a quarter. However, hate crimes stayed about the same. But it's a very important statistic to understand, because while we saw less in-person hate groups, they were still going out and doing hate crimes, which is obviously the end goal of hate groups and is what causes real physical harm to people in the real world. Radical conservatism was not shrinking, but decentralizing. This didn't make them harmless. What it did was protect their asses from the typical hate group cycle of getting the public's attention, making allies in conservative media, swelling their numbers, and then eventually disgracing themselves with failures in fighting and, often enough, members committing horrific acts of violence. So what that does is when you commit a crime and you cite somebody for radicalizing you or creating this ideology, because it is an online group, all that group has to say online is like, well, we didn't know, John. I've never talked to the guy. It would be like if I were on this stream telling you all to go out and go down to your local police department and do something illegal to them. And then you went and did it. And then if it came back to me, I'd just be like, well, I, I was joking. I didn't know anything. And that has happened. Because in person, it, it's pretty easy to spot someone wearing a KKK outfit. The Proud Boys love wearing their silly little outfits to go defend their right to go do hate crimes. But online, it's super easy to hide behind a wall of anonymity. And for those who incite the violence to deny their involvement in it, it doesn't matter if mass shooters have cited people like Ben Shapiro or PewDiePie in their manifesto, which are both real things that have happened. People have cited Ben Shapiro, Tim Pool, PewDiePie in mass shootings. All they have to do is hand wave it away as be and say, I never called for that. And then they get to go on with their lives. So this here is a clip of Milo Yiannopoulos hanging out with Richard Spencer and a bunch of other neo-Nazis while they are sig heiling him at a karaoke night. This is just something that existed in 2016. And Milo went on to still have a very widely successful commentating career. So the alt-right and their fellow travelers these days don't so much have members. They have hashtags, followers, viewers, and subscribers. This insulates them from their own audience. If Gabe, as a member of that audience, were to go out and commit a crime on their behalf, there'd be little doubt they had a hand in radicalizing him, but it'd be very hard to claim they told him to do it. This distributed nature is what makes the alt-right and the movements connected to it unique. You may remember a notable proof of concept for this strategy. The so Innuendo Studio Studios actually linked it back to Gamergate. And if you look at while he's, uh, I believe this would be, actually this isn't 4chan. I don't know what board that he's looking at here. But you can see what people are saying, like white self-hatred is sick. Anti-racist is a code for anti-white. Diversity is something the last white person. They, they really get personally attacked when you try to do things and say, hey, maybe we shouldn't be racist, which is a little bit of a self-report. But even Nazis now know not to call themselves Nazis because the attention to optics is an extremely important thing to growing a new audience. Even racist people know not to say, yeah, I'm racist because it looks bad and they understand that. Now, we watched a time capsule video about Milo's view on Gamergate, but I want to show you a video from 20 
2017 from a relative nobody, a normie on the internet who was sharing what he calls his first red pill movement. So this is a video from YouTuber Wild Smile. People like myself who just watched a series of strange politics unfold revolving around a lifelong hobby were beginning to see the same thing happening with the election. What happened as soon as there were critics of said female candidate? Misogyny, white pride, anti-science, Islamophobic, the list goes on. Any criticism meant that you were a dirty neck-bearded moron who was obsessed with guns. This woman, Hillary Clinton, had one of the most controversial careers in politics, and anyone who has known her for as long as I have knows this even if they accept it. Her defeat, as you might imagine, has been blamed on hatred towards women, science, people of color, just about anything except Hillary Clinton or her actions. In conclusion, Gamergate and the 2016 election followed a lot of the same tropes. I believe Gamergate opened my eyes just a little bit to the style of backstage politics, enough for me to be able to see it on a grander scale. Now, if you're not aware of the terminology, a red pill moment is just a moment where people typically on the right wing spectrum use it as a way that they've opened their eyes. It's a reference to The Matrix, which is famously a very anti-woke film. It definitely wasn't made anti-capitalist views by uh, two trans women, but it's a reference to the idea that you take the red pill and open your eyes to what is really happening. And he relates Gamergate to the 2016 election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And while that may seem ridiculous, we even see echoed in this comment here. Gamergate was the reason I no longer call myself a liberal. And I've said this many times before, but what the alt-right loves to do to manipulate people into sliding into their ideology is to pair their rhetoric with a tiny nugget of truth. Something that people can latch onto and be like, hey, I've thought that way or I've felt that way. And so maybe what this person is saying is correct. And in this conclusion that Wild Smile does here, he and I actually agree on something. The thing that helped radicalize him to the right is one of the same things that radicalized me to the left. The truth that the Democratic Party's 2016 campaign of running Hillary Clinton into the least electable person you could ever imagine, being Donald Trump, and Hillary Clinton losing was a major turning point for a lot of people. For Wild Smile, it signaled that this entire Democratic Party was just like the Gamergate-era feminists who unfairly pushed valid criticisms away as sexism. This sucked him into the Trump era of conservative politics a perceived contrarian and outsider who was above the liberals and the establishment right. Now, Wild Smile was not alone in that assessment. That is not a correct conclusion to come to, because I personally saw it more as a signal that the Democratic Party and its elitism was detrimental to the people they were supposedly working to represent. I wasn't personally fully radicalized until 2020 when I saw the exact same thing play out with Bernie Sanders and the DNC, because Bernie Sanders brought a lot of hope to young people across America, and they ran him into the ground. And now while Wild Smile is no longer an active content creator, there were many, many content creators who ran with Gamergate and content like it for many, many years and grew considerable fan bases from it. Because as the surfs say in their video about Gamergate, content creators and content watchers were actively feeding into each other to keep pushing Gamergate era culture war points. There's an ongoing debate as to how much the content creator influences his audience versus how much their support influences the creator. Many channels who weren't household alt brand names yet had suddenly discovered a digital goldmine. Talking about Gamergate was an internet oil rush that the right had been looking for, pushing the entire thing directly into the culture wars. It's true that yes, I'm very sympathetic to, to the Gamergate side of all of this. So there's an obvious profit motive here, and it became an Ouroboros of content. People that watched the videos made the creators money, which then caused them to make more videos, which got more viewers, which gave them more money. You get the idea. It's a common cycle online. And this is where Sargon of Akkad comes in. We mentioned him previously. Watch this clip as he self-admits that he is pushing an ideology, one that he has no shame in describing while he completely misses the point of Starship Troopers. Alongside him, Carl Benjamin, better known as Sargon of Akkad, the online skeptic community began to overlap with the anti-feminist one. Carl's particular hatred of online feminism combined perfectly with his inability to do substantial research into any of the topics he discusses. When people say something like, well, the humans provoke them by entering into their habitats, they are assuming that the bugs are merely mindless animals that act on instinct, rather than informing the Mormon extremists that this planet was actually inhabited, and at least delivering a demand that they leave, the bugs instead massacred them all without mercy. Why do I want this unironically? 
So Sargon of Akkad, this supposed figure of Gamergate, and it's totally normal, gay lesbian, by the way, that you had no idea what Gamergate was, because while you might not know that there's a name for it, like Skyfall says, its effects are pretty far reaching online. It's why you had online like discourse around like The Last of Us 2, a game that people widely love, but critique. It also feeds into the same blowback of when they like remade The Little Mermaid, but with Halle Bailey, a black actress. So when it comes to stuff like this, it, it permeates and all this ideology keeps resonating and people like Sargon of Akkad are the ones pushing it because they make money off of it. I'll tell you what, I didn't watch The Little Mermaid because I don't know, it doesn't interest me. It didn't ruin my life though because they remade it. Same thing with the 2016 version of Ghostbusters. Was it a good movie? I have no idea. It also did not affect me negatively either way. And so while Sargon of Akkad here exemplifies that he cannot understand critical thinking, trying to say that no, actually Starship Troopers, a movie that is entirely a critique of fascism, was actually, they were the good guys for going and doing the fascism. Like, that, that's his ideology. His ideology, as he admits, is I want to go do fascism. This has been a very big, broad overview of Gamergate, and I did not get into any of its intricacies. There is a ton more info that I've left out, so if you are interested in learning more, watch this video by the Serfs. It does a pretty good job going over everything except for Anita Sarkeesian. For some reason, they ripped that part out. Watch the video that we showed before from uh, Innuendo Studios about Anita Sarkeesian. It's a very, very deep hole. But it's been years since Gamergate won, right? So surely we moved on to different talking points, right? No, folks, that's right. Wokeness is dead. Why is wokeness dead? Because Sydney Sweeney has boobs. This tweet has 57,000 likes. And the point of it is that the wokes hate when Sydney Sweeney has boobs. So apparently, boobs are anti woke. Do not tell the hundreds of queer folk in our Discord server because I hear sometimes queer people like boobs. And get this some queer people even have boobs. I know, I know it's scary to hear that, but let's look into this post a bit because Richard is really, really trying to push the idea that somehow conventionally attractive young white women such as Sydney Sweeney are being pushed out of woke society. So the implication is that woke society is pushing people like Sydney Sweeney out. Do not tell Taylor Swift that. She's going to be so heartbroken when she finds out that white women are being pushed out of society. Or definitely don't tell Sydney Sweeney's old co-star Hunter Schaefer. She's going to be fucking pissed when she finds out hot young white women are getting pushed out. Oh, and do not tell Kendall Jenner. She's going to be so pissed. I mean, this tweet has over 50,000 likes. Surely this Richard guy has a point, right? He's not just making an insane, uncoherent, unthought out point, right? Well, Richard wrote out this article titled, Yes, Sydney Sweeney's Boobs Are Anti-Woke. So let's parse through it. He says, if you're going to trace the peak of the culture wars circa 2014 to 2021 to one opening shot event, it would probably be... Gamergate, which was largely about the sexualization of women. Before that controversy, video games had often made female characters sexually attractive. This is because their audience is overwhelmingly composed of men who are in general more interested in women's breasts than her intellect or personality. In a free market, video games catered to the male gaze. This wasn't part of anyone's agenda as much as it was supply meeting a demand that was rooted in nature. So he has made several assertions here. The first one being that gamers are overwhelmingly men, which let's look at the stats. Sure. Since Gamergate, the average male gamer rate is 55%. Now, this graph doesn't take into account non-binary folk, but deal with me here with the data. I don't know about you, 55% is not an overwhelming amount of gamers. Even at its peak in 2006 here, 62% is still not an overwhelming amount of gamers being male. Now, this implication is also that since Gamergate, video game characters are no longer hot. Ever since Gamergate happened, hot video game characters are not allowed to exist. They made it so we can't make hot women with big booba anymore. Well, let's take a look at a video game that came out in 2016, shall we? A game called Overwatch. I'm pretty sure Mercy is a hot big booba character from 2016, but I hear you, maybe that was before the wokes took over gaming. So let's see what Overwatch, the same game, put out in 2023. Oh, a hot Peruvian woman. So what's the problem? It's they're still putting out hot characters to play as. One of the largest games of 2023. Baldur's Gate 3 gave you many options to romance in that game. Do you know who gamers chose? 
Was it the conventionally attractive white woman Shadowheart? You fucking bet it was. 51% of gamers played it. And I get it. Shadowheart is there to be hot and be romanceable. That's the point of the character because men, women, queer people, woke or not, like to romance people in games. It's a totally cool thing. Now, I personally was more of a Carlac guy. I loved her personality. She was awesome. I like the muscle mommy. There was really no wrong option to romance in Baldur's Gate 3. Except Gale. Fuck Gale. Gale can get fucked. All my homies hate Gale. My point being that the vast majority of video game characters are still designed to be unrealistically hot. Not just because men play game and men like Booba, but because women and Envy like to see hot people too, of course. But that doesn't mean having inclusion in a video game or any other form of media is bad. Because Auntie Ethel exists in Baldur's Gate 3, and I can guarantee you if you Google Auntie Ethel porn, you'll find it in about three seconds on Google, and she is a literal hag. Richard then goes on in this same paragraph, reference Mortal Kombat honing down their female sexuality. This trend, of course, hasn't been limited to video games. It is now standard in remakes or new adaptations of established franchises to make female characters less sexually attractive, with Space Jam and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles being clear examples. This is the Space Jam debacle that Richard's got here. Dude, I'm sorry that you can't crank it to Lola Bunny anymore, but you know what's crazy is you can still crank it to the one from the 90s. You can still crank it to her. That one still exists. But, you know, maybe we don't need a, a rabbit that we can crank it to in a kid's movie. Does that make sense? It's literally a child's movie. But you know what? That character doesn't meet Richard Sanders. He also references the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. He says, in the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, they not only made April black, but as ugly as possible, and okay faced, but literally the body of a short and obese 60-year-old woman. This isn't even about making a normal-looking woman. She's obviously misshapen for her age. Age. Beyond the diversification, you can see an evil philosophy at work here, where the desire for beauty is wrong and it not only must be catered to, it must be constantly disrespected. Kids should not see this film. He is describing a literal minor as being not hot enough. A character that is in high school as not being hot enough because she's black with an okay face and is short and obese. She is a teenager, man. If you don't know what April looks like in the newest movie, literally looks like a normal teenager in their art style. And he's pissed that he can't jerk it to a teenage rendition of April O'Neil. Richard goes on to say, when non-wokes notice this, leftists will often accuse them of being weirdos. It's sort of like having a commercial where in every group of friends of three or four, one guy has to be black, which isn't strange if it only happens once in a while, but becomes no when the same mathematically unlikely racial configuration is universal in TV advertising. In new adaptations of old works, people's looks often change, but it's worth thinking about why when it comes to women, that change is practically always in the same direction, making them less attractive, a claim that he does not provide any proof of. You can be for this or against it. Just don't lie to us by pretending the phenomenon isn't real. So what he's describing here is just liberal pandering and marketing. This idea of a token minority character is not something that's new. Surely we can all understand that companies as a whole mainly include diversity because it opens up their markets. That's the idea of capitalism. But the issue is Richard's solution seems to be to make everything white all the time. So he doesn't have to see another skin color or a normal person's solution might be to, I don't know, just allow diversity because not only does it most of the time not matter at all negatively, but it can actually increase the value of a work because through diversity, we can better tell and understand more people's stories. What Richard is complaining about here, April O'Neil being changed from a white woman to a black teenager in the year of our Lord 2024 is literally the exact same culture war talking points that were around a 2013 Cheerios ad. Now, I'm old enough to remember this ad. I don't know if a lot of you in chat are, but here is the ad that caused a ruckus in 2013. Mom. Yes, honey? Dad told me that Cheerios is good for your heart. Is that true? It says here that Cheerios has whole grain oats that can help remove some cholesterol, and that's heart healthy. Two 
a normal person, this is just an ad for Cheerios. But to people like Richard, he had an issue with this quote unquote forced diversity. There was such a public problem with this commercial that Cheerios removed the video from YouTube because of the amount of racist comments underneath of it. And if you don't believe me, here's a local news segment from the time. That's right, Kim. Marilyn Carter is a 67 year old woman from Buchanan, and she says this is just the way she was raised and she's not changing it anytime soon. I found that one commercial offensive to my taste for my generation of the biracial couple. So she emailed the station saying it is plain to see that this half breed child is being exploited and that is wrong. I call them half breeds. I'm sorry, but that's the way I was raised. This poor child is going to have hard knocks now the rest of her life growing up just because of the way our culture is. But when asked if she'd call herself a racist. No, no. Opinionated, yes. Racist, no. So, she clearly said an extremely racist thing. We can all understand that what she said was racist. And she tried to hide it behind this idea that she feels bad that that child is somehow going to get bullied by other racists. But like I mentioned before, Nazis know not to call themselves Nazis. This racist person knows not to say that she's racist because it's a bad look. So she's like, well, I'm just opinionated. It's how I was raised. And you might be saying, well, you just pulled a random old lady's comments. That's not indicative of the the larger issue your arguments are the same as a fucking woman who was born before the civil rights era again i cannot stress of how not long ago this was this was 2013 two years before gay marriage was legalized in the United States. This is not that long ago. Now, Richard goes on to ramble and ramble about some pretty irrelevant things. So I'm going to skip down to the bottom here. All this brings us back to Sydney Sweeney's boobs. Hell yeah, brother. From Cheerios to Sydney Sweeney's boobs. Uh, the more attractive women around us are, whether in real life or fiction, the less one is able to maintain two important leftist dilutions. That the sexes are or can be made interchangeable, and that sexual selection either is or can be made to be an unimportant part of human affairs. If Sydney Sweeney's boobs walk into a room, even Chris Hayes is going to experience a physiological transformation, while Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson would probably start openly ogling her without shame. Hayes would shuffle papers around, turn red, and try to repress feelings he would interpret as reflecting underlying misogyny he still needs to work through. Men like that don't want their instincts to get in the way of ideology and self-select into places such as universities and left-wing news channels, where they can interact with women who are similarly most comfortable in an environment that trends towards androgyny. And this is so indicative of the people like Richard missing the point entirely, right? Because they're not talking about Sydney Sweeney. They're talking about Sydney Sweeney's boobs and they're referencing her as a sexual object for men to desire. And that is the only reason why Sydney Sweeney exists. Someone mentioned it earlier. He does bring up the idea here. Sydney Sweeney coming from a family of MAGAs. Uh, maybe potentially not true, but it doesn't fucking matter because because he doesn't care about Sydney Sweeney's politics. He just cares that she's got big boobs and he's using that to push his anti-woke agenda. I think part of the confusion here is that leftists who are now going, ha ha, you think we hate boobs, which I'm one of those leftists, are not the kind of leftists who are in the driver's seat from 2014 to 2021. And this is a very common conflation of the idea of leftist thought because no leftist is pushing for covering up sexuality as a means to regress in society. The reason why people on the left criticize over-sexualization of women is because of the way men react to them. Women's negative reactions to female video game characters targeting a male gaze never stood opposed against their own bodily autonomy. In fact, the opposite is actually true. Depicting women solely as objects for men's use was and still is the problem. And women have fought for and are still fighting for the right to dress how they want and not be ostracized, whether that be in private, in public, or in professional spaces. It was not that long ago when I was still a child in the mid 2000s. It was a big deal that Hillary Clinton wore pants, that she wore a pantsuit. That was a big deal in my lifetime. Women were so policed on what they could and couldn't wear in a professional setting nonetheless. That's this article from Richard. We don't need to go into the rest of it because there is a lot of insane takes that he has. But if we listen to what Richard has to say, you might be under the impression that the woke people won in Gamergate, right? Like now everything is so sexually repressed and like now it's like it's not an issue anymore because society has changed. There couldn't possibly be a second Gamergate, right? Bethesda, there is nothing I love more than to, to, to sit down comfy chair 
turn on my PC, fire up a brand new RPG. I'm so excited to go there. And you know, I love nothing more than to be dragged out at every f***ing conceivable opportunity so you can f***ing current day us. Sorry, did you want to get immersed in our world? Yeah, well, guess what? F***ing pronouns! F***ing gender ambiguity! F***ing current day Californian shit! Because that's all we know! Because we're boring! We're so f***ing boring! This is one of the greatest clips online of all time. Now, this is a claim that I'm making right now. I have not seen anybody else make this claim. This clip is what sparked the beginning of Gamergate 2. It is not satire. This is the fucking pronouns heard round the world. The commune he his manifesto. The pow she her keg that finally exploded. The pro z zerbial straw that broke the camel's back. This was from just last year when Starfield, a game by Bethesda, came out. Now what sparked this guy's reaction? What wokeness has Starfield been on to cause this kind of meltdown? Folks, viewer discretion for this next part is advised because what I'm about to show you is some of the wokeness focused stuff you can possibly imagine. If you have small children or have recently ate, please pause the video until those things are remedied. Here it is. There we go. I did it. What? Name? He? What? Ne he? Him? Now, if you blinked, you might have missed it. He's upset because next to his name, it says he, him as a default option. And if you watch closely here, watch what happens to the he, him. She, her, folks. Oh my god. Wait, one more. They, them, no! They got Bethesda! Ah, fucking pisses me off, dude. I'm on this guy's side. This totally makes sense. That is what triggered this grown-ass man into doing a rant about how this game was ruined for him because Bethesda was trying to current day him. Do you know how disgusted he felt by this game? He went on to play it for another five hours after this moment. That's right, this was an hour and a half into a six and a half hour stream. And then the next day he played it again. And the next day was when that rant was actually from. And what happened in that instance was he was talking to a non-playable character and the non-playable character said, hey, I'm a woman, but just so you know, I was cloned from a man. And that is what sparked the fucking pronouns heard around the world because a female character was cloned from a male character. It's not even like saying that they were trans, just that it was a clone. And now here's the thing. After that moment, he went on to play the game for another 20 hours on stream. He played the game for a total of 31 hours and he ends his last session playing it talking about how boring the game was. If the game was good, I don't think he would have minded the quote unquote wokeness because it did not affect the game a single bit. Once he makes this selection as he, him, he never sees that again other than how people are referring to him in game now i can't prove that he wouldn't have minded the game if the game was better but it's just a hunch but conservatives love using underwhelming projects for being bad because woke there's a common phrase go woke go broke that they like to use but they're not realizing the real issue which is the game is bad because it's bad it's boring it's not fun that has nothing to do with the fact that you had to select your pronouns we're going to take a game like hell divers 2 one of the largest games right now it is an inherently woke and progressive game. You can't even choose gender in the game. You just select between brawny and lean, saying that body type has no impact on gameplay. The goal of this game is to extract oil from bugs on other planets that are fighting back against a colonial super earth that are advancing into their territory. It is an anti-war, anti-capitalist, anti-fascist, all in the exact same way that Starship Troopers is, which is the movie that inspired the game. And now we've already seen people like Sargon of Akkad struggle to understand the satire in Starship Troopers. But surely others wouldn't fall down into that same rabbit hole, right? It's been eight years. We had to have learned from our mistakes. Well, doing his best Alice in Wonderland impression is YouTuber November Hotel, who is overlaying some commentary about the real boogeymen of modern gaming over Hell Divers 2. So let's take a listen to what he has to say about the state of modern gaming. But if the correct checkboxes are ticked, this qualifies companies like Sweet Baby Inc. to receive ESG investment. In the case of Sweet Baby Inc., companies like BlackRock are its biggest investor. Companies like BlackRock, who is the world's largest asset manager with $10 trillion in assets, allegedly have a scorecard that factors in many different areas of diversity. And depending on the score a particular company receives, they will be eligible to receive investment from BlackRock. 
So now the main Gamergate 2 point has arrived. The issue isn't prevalent sexism or transphobia or racism or anything like that. It's Sweet Baby Inc., which we'll get into in a second, a company that is there to just punch up gaming scripts. Being supported by BlackRock, a famously woke and progressive company, as we can see BlackRock invests in the top military contractors, it is a top beneficial owner of Lockheed Martin, a weapons manufacturer, Boeing, a weapons manufacturer, General Dynamics, a weapons manufacturer, North Rob Grumman, a weapons manufacturer, and Raytheon, a weapons manufacturer. The implication that companies like BlackRock are what's causing video games to go woke and be bad is an asinine one. And this is what they're trying to go through on Gamergate 2, is that these investment companies and these funds are what's making people insert wokeness where it doesn't belong. Now, if you actually look into Gamergate 2 era politics, you'll see a lot of images like this. And we had Aloy on screen before. She's the character on the far right on the top. But on the top, you see Western video game characters who are women. And you see the voice actor who plays them, and then the portrayal, the on-screen portrayal. And the bottom is Eastern ones. And the implication is that they can't fuck all the characters on top, and that's why they're upset. That they can't jerk it to the ones on top, I guess. Because what else are you criticizing? Like, what else is there to be criticized in this image? And your argument comes down to cherry-picking, like, a few characters here and there. When I've already showed, there are still hot characters being made in nearly every single role. I already showed you Baldur's Gate 3. I showed you the new Overwatch characters, and those are two of the biggest games. So do you see how we've gotten right back to the exact same argument that we had in 2016? Gamergators can make it seem like it's about the degradation of games quality that they care about. And listen, I'm somebody who's played Madden since I was a child. That game hasn't been good since 2008, and I still buy it every year. But you know why that game's not good anymore? It's not because there's no hot women in it. There's never been hot women in Madden, it's a game about NFL football. That game's not good because EA is a dog shit company that cares about profits over creating a good product. When you look at a game studio like Bethesda, they, they were the ones who made Starfield. When was their last great game? Some might say Fallout New Vegas in 2010. Hold it! Those games are inherently progressive, mainly the Fallout series, as satirical critiques of capitalism and anti-war, and they're from an age before hyper-capitalism had tainted the gaming industry. Because now we exist in a world where microtransactions and battle passes and endless sequels instead of proper updates on games run rampant. So why are the gamers focusing on the same Gamergate anti-SJW talking points again? That's, that's true, Mositos. You can literally marry same gender in Skyrim. They put gay marriage in Skyrim in 2011 before it was legalized in the United States. And it didn't negatively affect that game, believe it or not. That game is still heralded as one of the best games of all time. I personally think it's a little overrated. I put a lot of hours into it, but it's just okay. And yeah, like you're saying, they get upset that you have to play as a woman in GTA 6. Even though GTA 5, one of the main characters is a critique of modern capitalism and its consequences. The Fallout TV show has had similar pushback because the main character in the Fallout TV show is a woman and the leader of the Brotherhood of steel is black and believe it or not there's extremely sexist and racist comments about how it's going to be a bad show because they made these decisions before they've even seen it so i want to show you this tweet from longtime internet persona boogie 2988 this was just a couple days ago less than a week ago Ten thousand likes hot take video games are supposed to be fun not lectures about why being a white man is bad this got ten thousand likes implying that there are games where the main point of the game is to make white men feel bad and now now, this is very obvious bait for a video that he links down here. But again, 10,000 people like this, 6,000 people reposted this. And a lot of those people didn't understand that it was meant to be bait and probably not meant to be fully real. How do I know that those people didn't understand it? Because even though it has 10,000 likes here, the video itself only
only has 19,000 views after six days on a channel that has 4 million subscribers. So very clearly, these people are not all converting to the views. So this person says, what game does this? A simple question, play one. So there are people agreeing with the premise that make white people feel bad. Saints Row 2022, obviously Minecraft is a joke. Most new games developed by women. Madden 24, I have to scroll far too long in character creation to find my pasty white ass. Any game Sweet Baby Inc. consults for. So who is Sweet Baby Inc.? That is the main focus of what's going on. Is this, this company called Sweet Baby Inc.? And all Sweet Baby Inc. is, is as they say, Sweet Baby Inc. provides narrative consultation at any stage of development, boasting a talented team with vetted industry experience to best bring your story to life. So they get hired on to punch up scripts and they've done games like Alan Wake 2, Sable, God of War Ragnarok, Spider-Man 2. And there are some great games in here. There are also some bad games like Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League. Do we think that Spider-Man 2 was good because Sweet Baby Inc. was involved? No. So then why do we think Suicide Squad was bad because Sweet Baby Inc. was involved? It's just the new current version of Anita Sarkeesian, a scapegoat in order to put all of their rage into. It couldn't just pop possibly be the result of late stage capitalism sucking people's souls out during a day job and then replacing quality art and media with an endless slop in the form of Marvel versus Captain Iron Man 4 Spider-Man somehow returned the video game because great media does still exist and there, there's still great media being made to this day games like Baldur's Gate 3 is great because it's free from a shareholder's influence because Larian Studios is independent movies like Poor Things or Dune 2 or pretty much anything from A24 are all amazing. TV series like House of the Dragon, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, or The Rehearsal. They're all great shows, and these things can be both inclusive and good, and often are both. But the reason why you didn't like Madam Web wasn't because it was Spider-Man but all women. The reason you didn't like Madam Web is because it's a bad movie with bad writing. So will 2024 ultimately play out like 2016 did? With Donald Trump getting elected, and the Democrats shaking their head and blaming progressives, and the United Kingdom somehow leaving the European Union a second time, but this time even harder than before? Probably. But what we can do in the meantime is if you see someone sliding down into the alt-right pipeline in your personal life, or if you catch yourself, please work towards correcting that ship. We don't need everyone to be proud flag-waving socialists, but we definitely need way less reactionary talking points dominating our news cycle. And if we are worried about 2016 repeating in 2024, maybe we should petition the Cincinnati Zoo to put up an extra barrier around Fiona's habitat, just in case I don't want another Harambe.